Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. Last episode, we witnessed Empress Rana Faluna's worst fears come to reality. A conspiracy between European industrialists and their supporters in the Malgasy army attempted to overthrow the queen and install her son, only to end in terrific failure. At the end of the day, the queen still stood strong, and she was forced to exile the island's remaining foreign population. But while it seemed like the elderly queen may live forever, she was, in fact, mortal. And in 1861, the 33-year-long reign of Rana Falona came to an abrupt end. All hail the new king of Madagascar. Let's see how long he lasts. Season 4, episode 23, Radama II. The four years following the failed coup against Rana Falona was a period of slow stagnation. The deportation of Jean Laborde didn't necessarily mean that the industrial center of Mantasoa had to stagnate and decline. There were decades of qualified and capable Malgasy, people who had worked as managers at Mantasoa for decades, who could have slid seamlessly into Laborde's position. But nobody did. The people working these factories, even in supervisor positions, were typically Fanampuana draftees. They had been mostly unpaid or paid very little. Their presence at the factory created a gulf in their family farms. For proletarians and managers alike, there was no love for Matasoa, and no desire to keep the factories running. So after Laborde was kicked out of Madagascar, nobody took his place. Managers and proletarians alike walked away, returning home to their family farms where they were sorely needed. The water wheels powering Africa's oldest industrial park ground to a halt. The factories lay abandoned. The blast furnaces went cold. Government officials stopped coming to visit, so the hotels became empty husks. The animals in the Queen Zoo withered and died, while her swimming pool became a stagnant pond. The Lambert coup and the Queen's response had also reversed the brief thaw in relations between Madagascar, France, and Britain. Hostility once again defined the relationship between Europe and Madagascar, and another de facto economic embargo was the result. It was in this environment in which, in 1861, Rana Falona passed away, marking the end of an era. When it came to the selection of her heir apparent, Rana Falona had long openly favored her son, Rakoto, as her successor. While you could easily expect that the prince's open involvement with the Lambert coup might have hurt his chances at ascension, Rakoto faced no serious consequences for it. While it's debatable whether his involvement in the actual coup attempt was genuine, or if he was simply acting as a mole for his mother's government, what is not deniable is that he did genuinely believe in the principles laid out in the Lambert Charter. But while the queen found her reasons to forgive Rakoto, not everyone in the Merina court did. Rakoto's reputation as a radical westernizer provoked fear in the hearts of Madagascar's leading conservatives. As Rana Faluna grew ill, both progressive and conservative factions in the military bureaucracy, and religious establishment mobilized to support their favorite candidate. At the beginning of her reign, Rana Faluna had gone out of her way to eliminate potential future rivals. Through murdering a large portion of the royal family, Rana Faluna ensured that there were few remaining challengers to her and her son's position. But this did not make Madagascar entirely replete with pretenders. There was only one man with anywhere close to enough actual standing to seriously challenge the ascension of Rakoto his cousin, Rambu Asalma. Well, calling him his cousin is kind of misleading, since Rambu Asalma had long since been adopted by Rana Faluna as a son, making him both Rakoto's cousin and his adopted brother. Rambu Asalma had a reputation for being a headstrong and radical conservative, a close ally of prominent conservative Sampie guardian, Rani Joharie. But outside of a group of staunch conservative Sampie guardians and bureaucrats, Rambu Asalama had little popular report in the faction which truly mattered, the army. Owing to the fact that most officers in the army had received western-style education, reformists dominated the upper ranks of the military, including the commander-in-chief, Raini Layarifuni. With military support by his side, Rakutu could safely ignore the small opposition. Under force of arms, Rambo Salma and his allies were unceremoniously exiled from Antanarifu and kept under house arrest as the king's coronation began. 
Rakoto went out of his way to ensure that the official coronation would be a grand affair and a marvelous statement. As everyone expected, the crowning of a new, foreign-friendly prince was itself an incredible showcase of his radical departure from his mother's policies. Alongside crowds of thousands of Malagasy onlookers, foreign dignitaries, merchants, and most shockingly of all, missionaries and priests were also among the crowd. Soldiers, dressed in European-style uniforms carrying rifles with bayonets, lined the path to the Manjaka Miran. To imagine how Rakoto looked on this day, conjure a mental image of the famous French general Napoleon Bonaparte's clothing, but imagine it being worn by a Malgasi man. A pallet of golden thread sat affixed on each of the prince's shoulders, while a sash stretched from his shoulder to his hip. Beneath the sash, he wore a dark military jacket, held in place with a leather belt and decorative cufflinks on each wrist, topping it all off with a bicorn hat atop his head. He rode through the gap in the crowd on an imported steed, a beautiful black horse, trotting along the path formed by his soldiers on each flank. From there, the king ascended to the royal palace. In a powerful statement of his political allegiance to the westernizing movement, as well as to his own Christian sympathies, the man to place his mother's crown upon the prince's head was not a Sampia guardian or minister of state, but a Catholic missionary, a man who would have been considered an enemy of the state just a few weeks prior. With the crown on his head and his bold statement made, the once prince of Madagascar was no longer Rakoto. Instead, he adopted the name of the man who was, while not his biological father, his legal ancestor. From this day on, there was no more Rakoto, only Radama II. When evaluating his rule, calling Radama II a reformer would be selling him short. No, Radama I, and to an extent Ranafaluna, were reformers. Radama, instead, didn't view himself as a reformer, but as a revolutionary. The king, after all, had spent much of his princely youth actively undermining the cruelest elements of his mother's judicial system, and providing direct aid to the poor. People expected a radical change upon his ascension to power, and in the days following his coronation, Radama II did not disappoint. Within days of taking power, Radama passed out radical decrees undoing almost all of his mother's policies. To start with the most significant, he fully abolished the use of the Tangena ordeal. The practice of testing people's innocence or guilt using poisoning ordeals was, in Radama's view, simply unjustifiable. So the practice was done away with. Regarding economic policy, Radama's major reforms were twofold. For starters, he dramatically cut back the extent of the Fanampuana labor draft. Tens of thousands of workers, with a single decree, were released from their term of labor service and allowed to return home. This decision, while very popular among working-class people affected by the Fanampuana, essentially killed off Madagascar's experiment in domestic industrialization. While the factories at Mantasua and Amorunque had been inactive for a few years, it had only been a few years. He could have reorganized a new workforce, perhaps in a reformed Fanampuana system, to improve worker welfare and morale. But he didn't. The missed opportunity to revive Mantasua was even more disappointing when you consider that who else was returning to Madagascar but Laborde. Even prior to his coronation, Radama II had made it clear to Europeans in exile like Laborde and Lambert that Madagascar would again be open for business under his reign. We'll get to what Lambert was up to in just a moment, but Laborde returned to Madagascar at the first opportunity. However, the once enterprising industrialist returned not with the intent to open new factories, but instead to open new diplomatic avenues. But upon Laborde's return to Madagascar, Radama was informed that his old father figure was not here to open new factories, but was instead here to serve as the official diplomatic consul to France. In addition to his returning mentor, Radama retained another group of close friends who would become an integral part of his administration, the Menamaso. Radama's old group of friends had only become closer to the king after his ascension to the monarchy. While little is known about the personal details of Menamasu members as a whole, some of the men among its ranks included former factory managers, Christian converts, alcoholics, womanizers, and many other strange characters. But perhaps the most interesting member of this once countercultural movement, now within perpetual earshot of the most powerful man in Madagascar, was a man named Rajamasu. 
While most of the Menamasu were quite young, around the same age as Radama or younger, Rajamasu was an exception, as he was about 25 years older than the king, making him the clique's resident grumpy old man. A few things stood out about Rajamasu which made him an unusual influence on the king. For starters, he was a straight-up atheist. And I don't just mean that he was indifferent towards religion and generally didn't care much for it, and I don't just mean that he was not especially enthusiastic towards religion, I mean that the man was openly critical of both Christianity and the traditional Medina faith. To quote William Ellis, a missionary living in the country, and also by happenstance the cameraman responsible for most photographs of Radama II, quote, Rajamasu was neither Christian nor pagan, but a crude materialist, who ridiculed both godless superstitions and the truth of Christianity. He also treated the voice of conscience and public opinion with the same contempt. Basically, in addition to Rajamasu disliking Christianity, he also disliked the Merina religion and, well, kind of disliked everybody else too. This man was born in the wrong generation, as he would have fit right in on modern Reddit or Twitter. That said, he was also very bright. The old man was an undeniably skilled metalworker, who had become a renowned clockmaker in Antanarifu. Soon after, Radama appointed him as the official royal clocksmith, and even had him transform one of the wings of the royal palace into an impressive mechanical clock tower. He also loved experimenting with the revolutionary new technology of electricity, often peppering visiting Europeans with questions about just how the new technology worked or what it was, only to be disappointed when these travelers told him that they didn't quite understand it either. But while Rajamasu's role as royal clocksmith was innocent enough, the Menamasu quickly began filling up roles of far more significant political importance. While the exact legislative process had changed significantly over the history of the Merina Kingdom, 33 years of Rana Faluna's rule had established that her system of legislation had become the expected norm from the country's elite circles. Under Rana Faluna, the queen or prime minister would formulate an idea, review it with the other, then pass it around her circle of inner ministers, including Sampier guardians and bureaucrats. Then, only once they had come to a consensus, she called a cabarie, one of those many, many royal assemblies you've heard about over the season, and announced the legislation with the assembled crowd. This assembly was used to gauge the crowd's reaction, a crude barometer of public opinion as a whole, which, taken into account, would allow her to either move forward with, tweak, or abandon the legislation. Now, Radama II scrapped this process altogether. His new process was much more streamlined. He would discuss his policy ideas with the Menamasu and see how they felt about it. When this echo chamber of his friends and sycophants inevitably approved this planned legislation, Radama then proceeded to inform his prime minister and bureaucrats of what he and his friends had agreed on, and then order them to go and make it happen without input. As for reviewing it with the Kabarie, he just, well, didn't. Radama II would insist that laws were already passed by the time a Kabarie happened, so if it turned out that the public hated the law, they just have to get over it. And, I mean, of course Radama II felt this way. After all, to Radama II, he and his friends were the enlightened population of Madagascar, while the common people were just ignorant proletarians, not aware of what was best for them. They wouldn't understand that he was trying to spread the light of modern European-style civilization as they were too busy clinging to their idols. Radama's obtuse unwillingness to involve his bureaucrats, particularly the prime minister in his decisions, would end up having disastrous consequences for his rule. After all, Radama II owed his ascension to power to the Rhiney brothers in the first place, and now he was just going to blow them off and refuse to take them seriously as statesmen? Radama also earned the ire of another significant political figure, his wife. The relationship between Radama II and his wife mirrored the relationship between his mother and his legal father. Just like Radama I and Rana Faluna, Radama II also had a marriage that was arranged and passionless, between him and a woman almost 15 years his senior. She was also his cousin, the princess Radubo. On its own, the age disparity resulted in some problems. It turned out that not everyone had Rana Faluna's miracle womb, and that given his wife was over 40 when they were first married, the two struggled to conceive a child. The difficulties with conception further alienated a couple who were already vastly divided on a personal level. Like her aunt-slash-mother-in-law, 
Radobo was also quite conservative, albeit not anywhere close to the same degree as Rana Faluna. More than anything else, she was a traditionalist, which included strict adherence to traditional gender roles. Ironically, this meant that unlike the headstrong and assertive Rana Faluna, Radobo adhered to the expectation of political submissiveness for marrying a woman. Meanwhile, despite his ostensible Catholicism, it shouldn't surprise you that Radama II maintained his country's long history of royal polygamy, taking many wives and concubines, resulting in his own wife developing a sort of insecurity. Due to their troubles conceiving, the two did end up adopting a few children, but that was it. Beyond public appearances, they were barely even a couple. While Radama was busy peeving his most powerful and crucial allies and family members alike, he continued to act new radical reforms. Some of these laws were even a bit too radical for his fellow reformers, like the Raini brothers. It was a fateful duo of decrees issued in 1862 that would mark the beginning of the end for Radama's rule. These two reforms were intended to reinvigorate the Malgasy economy, which was in a state of rapid decline. While the end of the industrialization of Mantasoa played a role in this decline, the biggest factor by far was Radama's demobilization of the Fanampuana. It turned out that the relaxing of the corvée system absolutely crippled the state's ability to maintain or expand infrastructure, resulting in the further weakening of an already fragile and inefficient system of transportation. As a result, the Malgasy economy increasingly atomized and localized, with small communities becoming more and more isolated from their ability to trade with the national economy. This also cut off these areas from being able to supply labor to the state, creating a feedback loop of insufficient labor to work on infrastructure, resulting in further infrastructure problems, making it harder to receive labor. In an effort to alleviate the growing shortage of labor available to the state, Radama enacted his first radical reform, the Emancipation of 1862. Now, fun fact about Radama II, in his personal life, he was an abolitionist who detested the institution of slavery. He thought that it was a moral wrong that ought to be expunged. On the other hand, though, he wasn't entirely an idealist, and he recognized that abolition was an unrealistic expectation for a country whose economy was so heavily dependent on the institution. See our past episode on labor in the Kingdom of Madagascar for more info on that. Regardless, Radama II formulated a solution to kill two birds with one stone, Reduce the number of people in slavery by adding them to the Fanampuana. In a decree of emancipation, Radama II ordered the emancipation of several thousand primarily Sakalav enslaved workers, with the caveat that they were to immediately register for full Fanampuana service. Only enslaved Malgasy were emancipated, since enslaved workers imported from mainland Africa had no ancestral connection to the land, and therefore could not properly perform Fanampuana. This policy was met by immediate and fierce opposition from the Malagasy public. While Radama II was most likely not actually trying to implement a general emancipation, his abolitionist sympathies were fairly well known among the public. Fear of a general abolition of slavery overtook the Malagasy elites, who, in many cases, were also upset at the loss of their own human property for state labor efforts. In a campaign to remedy the situation and dissuade fears of impending abolition, Radama II quickly backslid on his abolitionist principles. To compensate for emancipation, Radama began importing even more enslaved workers from mainland Africa to try and even out the losses from this limited emancipation. Even so, the fears that Radama was trying to implement a general abolition of slavery were never fully abated. But while the fears of abolition led to unrest among the nobility, even more concerning was Radama II's handling of trade and property policy particularly with regards to foreign trade with France. Last episode, I claimed that I am confident that Radama II was fully invested in the Lambert coup, rather than simply being pressured into signing or acting as a royal spy. Well, what happened next is the crux of why I believe this to be the case. Remember how Lambert had not yet returned to Madagascar despite his exile being lifted? That's because, in the years 1861 and 1862, he had been busy in France securing support and investment for his new take on the French Madagascar Company. And Radama II was on the exact same page. When Lambert finally did return to Madagascar, the Mpanjaka Madagascara drafted, with the help and advice of his mentor and consul Jean Laborde, 
a new treaty to govern Franco-Malgasy relations. The new treaty included a French recognition of Malgasy independence and sovereignty, and then immediately undermined that very same sovereignty by including an exact copy of the Lambert Charter. In retrospect, with our current knowledge of how Madagascar's relationship with the French will end up, Radama's insistence on so dramatically weakening his own sovereignty to the benefit of a foreign company seems, well, downright bizarre. Add to this the fact that French expansionist ambitions were not some far-off element of the future, but something that the Kingdom of Madagascar was already familiar with and had fought against in 1829. But to put ourselves into Radama's shoes for a moment, he wasn't thinking about global imperial ambitions when he drafted the treaty. Rather, he was thinking about how his personal friend could help him resolve the worsening economic situation throughout his country. Madagascar's economic woes had always been at least in part due to poor transportation infrastructure, an area which had been intentionally neglected by Radama's mother. Radama didn't have the labor at his disposal to build this infrastructure, especially not since the loosening of the Falampuana. Lambert was promising that he could fix that. He could fix the turbulent status of Malagasy exports by providing a stable means of trade. To Radama, Lambert was not a threatening specter of foreign influence, but a great potential source of foreign capital just waiting to be tapped into. It was this mindset, and his insistence on reenacting the Lambert Charter, which ultimately led to his downfall. While Radama II might have viewed Lambert as a great source of capital, and to be fair, many of the Manamaso agreed with him, he should have considered how everyone else felt. Particularly, the section of the charter featuring French ownership of Malgasy land and resources was simply untenable and would never be accepted by the bulk of the Malgasy population. Remember that while Radama II scoffed at the idea of Hasina and ancestral worship, most Malgasy people still very faithfully believed in the power of the concept. In fact, opposition to Radama's rule usually manifested itself in the form of religious revival movements, including the famous Ramanen Jana, or Dancing Mania. This religious revival movement sought to increase Merina investment in their traditional faith through large public gatherings of wild and uncontrollable dancing. If you'd like to learn more about the rise and fall of the Malgasi Dancing Mania, then you can learn more in our premium episode at patreon.com slash historyofafrica. And to those already supporting the show, a heartfelt thank you. In the Hasina system, ancestral land is a concept of incalculable value. Asking Malgasi people to give up land and resources, even that which was not currently occupied, to foreigners with no ancestral ties to the island was absolutely unthinkable you might as well dig up their ancestors' graves and give them to the foreigners while you're at it. Additionally, the abolition of export duties was setting up the Medina state for financial ruin, since export duties represented one of the government's few remaining significant sources of income. How much popularity Radama enjoyed before the 1862 reissuing of the Lambert Charter is tough to say, but the issuing of the charter plummeted his own stock among the public and elites including those who had been crucial in bringing him to power in the first place. The Raini brothers were the main concern. The younger brother, Commander-in-Chief Raini Layarifuni, generally tried to steer clear of the controversial politics of court, instead focusing his efforts on internal army improvements and working as an effective military bureaucrat. He even signed the 1862 treaty, not so much because he liked it as much as, well, it was his job. But Prime Minister Raini Vonina Hitritrioni was a different story. Not only did he disagree with the treaty, but he resented he and his bureaucratic peers' total exclusion from the process of drafting it. The backlash against the 1862 treaty was the first major step down a path of overt opposition to the emperor, and the beginning of the formation of an armed movement of resistance. If Raini Vonina Hitritrioni was already plotting a coup by this point, he was certainly helped along by Radama. While much of the public's opinion on the king had soured already, the majority of officers continued to take the commander-in-chief's lead and opted to stay out of the limelight of politics. But with the 1862 treaty, the limelight came looking for them. As had been predicted by opponents of the treaty, the abolition of export duties on French goods immediately tanked the royal treasury. To compensate, military salaries were cut 
turning a large chunk of the prestigious National Officers Corps into glorified unpaid interns. By this point, Radama's administration had few supporters in the army or government, and they limped on for only a few more months, lasting into 1863. In the background, Rani Voninehitri Troni continued to gather support. While he was himself considered to be on the progressive end of Marina politics, he began recruiting support not only from his allies, but also from former enemies. In a compromise to gain their support for his coup, he would ensure that their policies were implemented. Most importantly, meaning the reversal of the Christianization of the kingdom, and the restoration of the saint pierre to their rightful position as objects of national veneration. Meanwhile, Radama seemed perfectly aware of his increasingly desperate position, and continued to respond in the worst ways possible. Radama, a man who had been so outwardly Christian in the past, made some strange attempts to pander to Malgasy conservatives by making odd public displays of worship towards saint pierre and even for a few days at the end of his rule, agreeing to reintroduce some mild forms of Christian persecution. He instructed those of his wives who were Christian to never pray in public. When one of them refused, claiming it was against her faith, he made a prolonged scene of shaming the woman, screaming that Jesus Christ was a mere man, and that only Radama himself was close to God in stature. But the king's unhinged and sudden reversal of his political views did little to improve his standing among the conservatives, and only isolated his few remaining ultra-reformist allies. Finally, in 1863, Radama II made one final desperate attempt to stay in power through the enactment of an unusual policy, the legalization of murder. Now, this sounds absolutely absurd, but every biography and primary source, as well as just about every secondary scholarly source, confirms this ridiculous detail. Now, sometimes this is phrased in a way to make it sound a little more diplomatic, as Radama seeking to legalize the practice of dueling, giving him and his allies ways to settle religious and personal disputes with their many adversaries. However, even if this is the intention of the law, it essentially stated that as long as one party challenged another to a duel, that the resulting killing could not be legally punished. That law is so vague and unenforceable that it might as well constitute a legalization of murder. Since the policy was never enacted, it's hard to say for sure exactly what the king intended, or even what he was thinking to begin with. Maybe it was just meant as a rhetorical tactic rather than a serious proposal. Or maybe he was serious. And if you look at some transcripts of his meetings with the prime minister, it really does sound like less of an effort to legalize dueling then the king simply tried to make murder into a legally acceptable thing to do. For example, during a meeting discussing the king's plans to decree a Malgasy purge sequel, the prime minister, shocked that the king's instability had gone so far, he asked, quote, Do you, before these witnesses, declare that anyone who wishes to fight, to attack any other person with firearms, spears, or swords, that you will not prevent them? And that if he kills someone, you will not punish him? Radama II responded, Yes. By this point, firmly done with dealing with this monarch, the exasperated Raini Vonina Hitratrioni simply stood up to exit the room with his fellow ministers, stating, quote, So be it, let us return to breakfast. Now, when he said breakfast, he meant plotting a coup to overthrow Radama. And on May 12, 1863, the prime minister and his supporters sprang into action. Falling prey to an ambush by a group of assassins, the king was strangled to death. Reportedly, the king's last words were a final double entendre. I have never shed blood, referring both to the benevolent monarch that he saw himself as, and that, since he was choked to death, his blood never truly was shed. For the first and only time in Merina history, a palace bureaucrat murdered a sitting monarch. Or did he? While the official history claims that Radama died that day as he was strangled to death in the royal palace, rumors quickly spread among the king's remaining supporters that he was still alive, living in a far-off countryside exile, simply waiting for his moment to return and exact revenge on his treacherous prime minister. Just like the public of its day, Malagasy historians are to this day divided on the matter of Radama's demise with a respectable faction advocating that the rumors of Radama's demise had been greatly exaggerated. 
that the assassination was a hoax agreed to by Radama and his hostile ministers, designed to ensure that after his exile, nobody tried to reinstate him. But regardless of its veracity or falsehood, the hopes of Radama's allies never did manifest. If he was alive in exile, he stayed there for the rest of his life, never mounting a serious attempt to retake his position as king. So while Radama the man may have survived, Radama as a serious player in the history of Madagascar died on that day in 1863. For a man who had been widely perceived for decades as the future of Malgasy politics, Radama II lasted a little under two years as king. I would argue that he was, in fact, the least effective ruler in Malgasy history. Of all of his many, many reforms, the abolition of Tangena was the only one which outlived his time on the throne, with the rest being repealed within a few months of his removal from power. While Radama's reign was undoubtedly a failure, though, his legacy and the historical memory of Madagascar is much more complicated. More sympathetic histories paint Radama II as a well-intentioned and enlightened man, too ahead of his time for a reactionary Malgasy establishment, highlighting his humanitarian policies of lightening the Fanampuana and outlawing Tangena. Critical histories, on the other hand, highlight the economic and political turmoil of his policies and autocratic style of government. Anti-colonial historians have been particularly harsh on Radama II, focusing on the ways that his Treaty of 1862 dramatically undermined the sovereignty of his own kingdom in favor of French economic interests, a sort of precursor to the colonial era that would eventually befall Madagascar. And, interestingly, not a single one of these statements is untrue. But one element of Radama's reign that goes overlooked far too often is, ironically, perhaps the most important immediate legacy of his reign, the battle between the monarchy and the bureaucracy. Radama's form of rule, which relied heavily on an autocratic monarch informed by the advice of a cabinet of unofficial personal associates, represented a novel concept in Marina history, one that was quickly and violently rejected by the government. The king's overreach and subsequent removal from office entered in the final chapter of Manina political history, the end of the powerful monarchy and the institution of military rule. Join us in our next episode, as the overthrowing of Radama causes a political rupture between the Raini brothers, and the birth of a Merina constitutional monarchy supported by a harsh military dictatorship. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like our show, then we would greatly appreciate if you could help support the show and our project of freely available online history education. You can do this by supporting us at patreon.com slash historyofafrica, providing us a rating or review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or iTunes, or by sharing the podcast with anyone who you think might enjoy learning about African history. This episode is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Naomi Kanakia, Ayo Fogbamie, Morgan Blackmore, Dimitri, Emmanuel Zaudi, Alexander Travis, B.B. Milliam, Conrad Schwenke, Travis Bell, Johnny Knowles, Godfrey Sevalabie, Evan Edwards, Pascal Nwokocha, Joe Maxwell, Nkechi Nwabodike, Shea Unodron Bacho Amankwa, Douglas Harder, Craig Bolton, Samuel Badu, Hassan Firgiani, Niti, Kitty, and Tariq Beetleman, among others. Thank you all for supporting the show. It really, really, really means a lot.